Hello and welcome to Awesome Astronomy episode 93 part 1 The Astronomy Show for March 2020 and welcome to the first month of the year again. On this show we're siding with the ancient Romans who lumped January and February together as an unnamed cold dark month known simply as winter. So as March is now returned to the first month of the year, Happy New Year again! Happy New Year! Hey. For anyone who was wondering why October isn't the 8th month or December the 10th, Well, it is once again as the ten months of the Roman calendar ran from March till December. And as your Martian overlords in waiting, we can have even more reason to welcome the month of March, as in both the Gregorian and Julian calendars, March is named after the god of war, Mars. And as if trying to appeal to us or impress us, since the days of LBJ, the United States has favoured this month for kick-starting the majority of its wars and international tours of destruction. Vietnam, Yugoslavia and the shock and awe invasion of Iraq. In 2011, you really sought to please us with the start of both a covert war in Syria and a very overt one in Libya. The more you kill of each other, the less work there is for us to do. From Ho Chi Minh to Colonel Gaddafi and hundreds of thousands of innocent collateral damage in between, you're doing us proud. And as it's March again, fancy another land war for old time's sake? Or perhaps with coronavirus gripping the world, mass floods in the UK and locusts decimating East Africa, you're leaving it to the gods. After all, we're just a quartet of horsemen away from the end times, if you go in for that kind of thing. And after that jolly introduction, I'm Ralph, your host for this month, and joining me to welcome the Ides of March is the backstabbing Brutus Paul. (laughs) You're finished now. And the lady who hath become death, the destroyer of worlds, Jen. I see you. I see all of you. God, that was sinister. Whoa, that is. That's, yeah. uh, well, that was what I was going for, so I'm glad that that worked out well. <laughs> You're saying four horsemen. Did you see my favourite bit of the coronavirus so far? If you can have a favourite bit your, of the coronavirus. Your favourite bit so, of it? My favourite bit of the is coronavirus story. Is coronavirus just a sitcom? Not it's a, just a not, sitcom. Not well, an almost I, pandemic. It is brilliant. It's, you watch it on telly, it's funny. Uh, the. Um, <sighs> The the first people evacuated from China back to the UK. Did you see how they were picked up from um, RAF Bryce Norton? Uh, in rubber gloves, I would imagine. Was this on the coaches? They sent four coaches from a company called Horseman. No, they did not. <laughs> they bloody did. Oh, yeah. man alive. There were four coaches with Horseman written down the side. It oh, was you couldn't make it up. Glorious. It was like, oh, someone had a laugh with that, didn't they? You, you can imagine someone in Whitehall went, oh, go on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, these guys these guys are stupid enough to do it. This, this, yeah. Horsemen, four of them. Book four. We don't need four. Book four. Four coaches yeah. called with horsemen yeah. written on the side. My God. So, yeah, the four horsemen turned up at RF Bryce Norton to carry <laughs> the patient to the hospital. <laughs> that was brilliant. Well... Places that are worried about coronavirus include New York. Uh, have you seen this? Like they're they're doing a massive crackdown and encouraging people to um, self isolate and self quarantine. Yeah, if they come back from China, and just in time. <laughs> just in time for me going off to New York. And why are you going to New York? Yeah. Oh, do you know what? I am going for a jolly. Well, no, I am going partially for a jolly and. Uh, going to the Cradle of Aviation for the Apollo 13 event, which I'm super excited about. Yeah, they impressed us so much you going back. I know, yeah, exactly. I can't wait. It's going to be a really good day. Like, we're kind of... We're in discussion with them now about, like, the running of the day for us because this is a ticketed event, right, which um, starts from 6pm, but we're going to be there as press, so we're going to be there from about 11. 11 in the morning, I think, is the plan. But either way... um, We know that Jim Level is confirmed, so is Fred Hayes. Um, We've also got Mission Control Flight Directors Milt Windler, Jerry Griffin, Gene Krantz, and NASA engineer John Aaron. That's a really good lineup from the Apollo uh, 13 mission. Bunch of people in Mission Control. Yeah, so that's on the 23rd of April. um, It is, it's the 23rd of April. Long Island. Yeah, out on Long Island, Crater Aviation Museum. Um, the ticketed event starts at 6pm, like I said. Um, 
as far as I'm aware, it's a cocktail hour and then a gala dinner where there's going to be a moderator asking questions to you know, the people that we just mentioned. Um, and then I'm presuming there'll be some sort of entertainment uh, after the food. Um, if, you know, meeting Apollo astronauts and engineers is not entertainment enough for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, April the 23rd. And if you go to cradleofaviation.org, you should be able to find it on there. And I know that there are some people from the UK that are already going over there. And mm. uh, and hopefully other people will find that interesting enough to uh, to book a ticket if there are any left, which it kind of looks like on the website, but I don't think they'll be available for much longer. So. No. Um, what what next have we got? Um, I suppose we should. Um, oh, while we're talking about events, um, uh, a good friend of ours and listener to the show, Becky Cunningham, just wants to give a shout out because she's doing a space art exhibition that's presented by the Redditch Astronomical Society and this is supported by the Royal Astronomical Society for British Space Week. Um, and the reason that I want to give a shout out here is because um, I don't know if anybody follows her on Twitter that's listening to this, but if you go to Cunning Cosmos on Twitter, um, she does some fantastic artwork mm. that's all mm. Apollo inspired. Um, and there's a wonderful God giving life to Adam kind of version where um, Adam's hand is covered in an Apollo spacesuit or, or the armies. And it's just some wonderful artwork um, that's all kind of inspired by the Apollo missions. Um, and that's going to be on the 3rd of March to the 5th of April at the Artix Gallery in Bromsgrove. So I, I would really uh, encourage you to go to artrix.co.uk and go and um, take a look at the, the exhibition they're going to be running there and go along. And that's a wonderful segue for a talk that I'm giving there, I think, as part of this event on the 28th of oh, March. Oh, are you? I am, yeah. Oh, this is hot off the press then. We've not heard of this. She doesn't tell us anything anymore. Ah, ha, I've been keeping it under the radar for uh, the <laughs> opportune moment, yeah. So I think that they're doing a, a huge, you know, event, um, you know, this the art exhibition is is all part of it sort of celebrating space and astronomy and um on saturday the 28th of march they're doing a big sort of series of talks and stuff so they've asked me to talk Mm. what are you gonna be talking about i am going to be doing a new talk that i haven't done before so that's slightly terrifying because it might be good it Mm. might also be crap i'm sure (laughs) it'll be fine wait to find out (laughs) i know exactly no i'm gonna do um the hidden universe so it actually links quite nicely with what we're doing in the new segment of the podcast where we're kind of going through the electromagnetic spectrum so my plan is that i I am gonna essentially do a little bit of a tour of the electromagnetic spectrum and have a look at all the different astrophysical phenomena that we can see by looking at light that we can't see yeah they have um i think their big sort of guest speaker is chris lintott that was mm-hmm. the last I heard. So he's going to be talking about his new book um, that I reviewed on here a couple of months ago. Um, Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, surprise! I'm going to be there too. <laughs> <laughs> so I think tickets tickets for that are on sale now. Excellent. So you should go to um, www.artrix.co.uk. That's A R T R I X dot co dot uk um and go and take a look at the event from the 3rd of march to the 5th of april it's all in there um now before we move on to the emails i think we should mention the passing of a couple of people and we'll start off with um somebody that's um, really happily been in all the news um the um, um kind of mentions to the passing of uh, Catherine johnson mm. who um was one of the mathematicians that was um involved in plotting a lot of the orbits and the um um, mathematics for the Apollo missions and was recently brought to people's attention in the film Hidden Figures um, and sadly she passed away but at the ripe old age of I think 101 which yeah. was uh, can't complain at 101 can you no you really can't and uh, and she got the I, th- I think it was the um, the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Barack Obama um, mm-hmm. about 10 years ago and you know it's just nice to see that there's some recognition there before it became a posthumous recognition. Yes, and, do you know what? You took the words out of my mouth. Was I was so going to say that, like, I'm so glad that she finally got recognised while she was still with us to enjoy that recognition. Yeah. And, I mean, what a what a history. I mean, she, she calculated um, trajectories and launch windows. 
um, and some of the emergency um, return parts and things for, for Mercury space flights, including Alan Shepard and John Glenn. Um, she did the stuff for the Lunar Module and Command Module um, rendezvous flight sort of moments. Um, and she was she even worked on the shuttle program right at the beginning. Oh, I wasn't um, aware of that. Yeah, um, and she was even um, sort of working on some of the stuff, the, the sort of early versions of Mars missions and things that they, they were um, planning. So huh. um, she did some amazing stuff. Yeah. And so from the sublime to the ridiculous, we have another passing now of um, Mad Mike Hughes. And mm. uh, I don't think I could do this one. Uh, I, I don't <laughs> think I could keep this one as light as it needs to be, but without it becoming a little bit cruel. So does anybody want to uh, open up the can um, of worms about Mike Hughes? <laughs> we've mentioned him before, haven't we? Because he's, he's, he, this is the guy who's got a steam... Well, had a steam-powered rocket. Um, <laughs> you heard that he, right, folks. <laughs> yeah, a steam-powered rocket. Um, mm. That He was a flurfer. He was a um, flat earther who was trying to prove the Earth was flat by launching himself in his own rocket because he didn't trust anyone else's because it was all fake and lies. Part of the conspiracy. Um, so he wanted to build his own steam-powered rocket to launch up. Now, actually, the tragedy of this was that he was basically being pushed onto this by the Science Channel. Yeah, mm. it was for a TV show, wasn't it? Yeah, and it, it, you know, this is not science. It, it was basically titillation, and 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 then they they kind of basically got him to do this. And it failed horribly. Um, I mean, I, I saw the video of the launch, and it, it it's, it's, it's an absolute disaster. He, he flings off the the launch rail, and the parachute immediately leaves the 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 rocket. And then you see the rocket sort of do a parabolic and impact downrange. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and so futile as well because this Completely. this attempt was only going to go to five thousand feet if it uh, mm. if it had succeeded, which you know that's like a seventh the height of an airliner. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's like, it was absolutely it, futile. It was never going to see the curvature of the Earth from five thousand feet anyway. No, so it was just ridiculous titillation by a TV channel to try and, and kind of create create something daft and silly, and it, it just it it killed someone um, for well, you know. We can all sort of laugh and point and say, oh, flat earther and all this thing. But, you know, it's sad. A human being died because... Because. And uh, that, that's... Well, it's just daft, really, isn't it? Yeah. So we'll go on to, to the emails now and we'll, we'll leave that one where it is. Um, mm. And the, the first email I want to mention comes from our good friend uh, Jackson Smitherson from somewhere in the US. I forget where. Um, that's a funny town. Greetings, Martian Overlords. I'm sorry? That's a funny town name. <laughs> it is, isn't it? But then they have places like that, don't they? You know, they like um, Truth and Consequences and all that stuff. Um, Greetings, Martian overlords and Earthly Queen Jenny from the coolest name ever, awesome astronomy title holder, Jackson Smitherman. Uh, many thanks for the super generous name drop. Uh, you do have the coolest name ever. Um, it is a very cool name. Please enjoy attached pictures and video of the 2019 Mercury Transit and the kit used to capture them, including the phone mount that Paul mentioned, the Celestron, Next YZ or Next YZ, I guess, um, in uh, in the US, which is as he described, super nifty. Here's hoping the mix of cool picks will help you decide not to strike me down during the impending Martian invasion of the Earth. Love the show, Jackson. And uh, yes, I mean, of course, <laughs> that does save you at the next uh, next invasion. But um, it was nice to tie this one up that um, somebody went out and got the Celestron mm. Next YZ and um, and agreed with your with your review, Paul. But also, uh, it doesn't work quite so well in um, in the podcast, of course. But uh, the pictures that he sent us were really good. Yeah, really uh, good. Just yeah. iPhone pictures of the uh, of the transit of Mercury, which yeah. showed kind of the relative sizes of the Mercury and Sun. And uh, you know, it's to me, it's that kind of thing of look how far we've come. That now, yeah. you know, it's not just looking through a telescope and it's not just taking photography, but you know, you can easily now just attach your phone to a telescope and get great pictures of these celestial events that yeah. um, you know just would have been been a pipe dream. I I tell you what, that, that piece of kit is such a boon to street astronomy and star parties because you can set up on a scope and people can put their own phones on yeah, and go course. home with a picture. Yeah, yeah. I'm, do I'm doing it this Friday with some kids um, in a local town. Yeah, And they're all going to be able to put their phones on, take a picture of the moon and Venus, things like that, and go home with a picture on their phone of yeah. something in astronomy, which is it, it's instant and it's brilliant and they, it, they love it. It's great. And, and I, w I would recommend that to anyone as an astronomical society as well. When you've got... Yeah 
particularly newbies that are coming along to uh, to come and take a look through a telescope, having something like this is a really good idea because we yep. find it all the time that people look through a telescope and they go, oh, is there any way that I could just get a picture of it on my phone? Yeah. Oh, well, if you've got a piece of equipment like this, then yes, they can. And then, you know, they'll be showing their friend, showing it to their friends and oh, exactly. they're kind of doing the promotion yeah. work for you then. Exactly. And in fact, it's really good for small kids and, and people who are not so good at looking through eyepieces because you can set it up. If you're looking at the moon, um, and the brighter planets things you can set up a, a phone and basically you've got a screen for them to look at without having to look through the eyepiece oh yeah yeah good point works really well works really yeah. well it's a great bit of kit highly recommend it okay so next up uh, an email from our friend uh, Greg Nickel in Sydney Australia who says hello Jenny Paul and Ralph sorry gents ladies first no problem there sexism. Greg sexism everyday <laughs> sexism Positive sexism. <laughs> I was listening to the February 2020 Part 1 episode when towards the end of the episode, something else demanded my attention for a few moments. We'll come back to that in a minute. How very dare you. Exactly. As I was, let's say, putting Humpty Dumpty back together, I heard from the podcast in the background, Centaurus, and then Crooks, then Rigel Kentaurus. Once I heard that, my thoughts, in very quick succession, went like this. That's in the Southern Hemisphere. But hang on, they can't see that from up there. Oh, it's a meteor shower. That's when it hit me. They do know we exist. As I hurriedly <laughs> skipped the episode back to the beginning of the Sky Guide, it's hard to describe the sense of privilege I felt wash over me, together with a warm, fuzzy feeling, in both of which I subsequently bathed luxuriously for the rest of the episode. And then, once I heard Jenny ask what it's like in February in the Southern Hemisphere, with this warm, fuzzy feeling, I felt that it was no less than my duty to give you a quick <laughs> report. I love it. I'm down. Thank you. And so he does give us a quick report. I'm down under in Sydney, and now at 23.45 hours on the 1st of February 2020, it's currently a brisk 30.7 degrees Celsius, <laughs> which oh, for our brisk. American listeners is oh. what, in the 90s? Jesus <laughs> Christ. <laughs> I am sitting here. I've actually had to put a second jumper on. I am freezing my tits off. I've, I'm this sat evening. in bed with a duvet on. I'm freezing. My do you know, I was driving this afternoon when the sun was out and my car pinged at me, the, the ice warning that it, it was falling below four degrees. <laughs> right? It's a little bit different. It's freezing here. A bit here. different in Sydney. Oh. Uh, he says there's hardly any breeze but plenty of mosquitoes, little and it's 32.7 degrees Celsius inside, but you can't see Centaurus from in there, and it's too hot, so who cares? Anyway, you needn't be concerned about it being too cool down here. I could handle it being a little cooler, but not much. Of course, this is after a day where it only got to 40 degrees Celsius. I don't know this whole climate thing. I haven't got the foggiest idea what they're talking about. My deepest thanks to you all for letting us exist, even if only briefly in an episode from time to time. But you kind of get used to that, sadly, if you live in the Southern Hemisphere. Love the show and keep up the good work. Oh, well, do you, do you know, we used to do a bit more for the Southern Hemisphere, didn't we? Well. And then, and then somebody else started doing a Southern Hemisphere sky guide, didn't they? Oh, the, uh, the first iteration of Paul is now doing that. Is, is he doing? Oh, Tom, is yes. he doing a southern southern one? I think one? so. Oh, I think he is. We should we should take a listen and then give that a shout out. Yes. Um, but uh, there's actually going to be a southern hemisphere meteor shower in, uh, in this sky guide as well, a bit later on. So all you upside down folk, uh, <laughs> that, there's one for you there. And finally, just want to say from our good friend Mark the Fridge, Mark says, I'm enjoying how the spaceflight show is almost out of date by the time it comes out, because this means <laughs> that the spaceflight world is making huge advances and is so busy. We've been rumbled. Have you considered changing the order of the shows to make the Space News show still up to date? Um, we we have the, considered that. that. That is the best backhanded compliment. I know, right? I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> but so yeah we, we have considered changing the order of the shows because we record it once um because you know just time um time constraints and, uh, and when we can actually get together to record so we record it once and that means that anything that we record that's kind of like 15 days old it, it has a chance of being out of date but the 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 sky um or rather the astronomy show 
we have to release that at the beginning of the month because it covers the whole of the month and you know we've got sky guides in there and everything that we can't miss bits out on and if there's anything that's in the news that's a bit out of date then we'll kind of rectify that in the next show um or if we if we miss something out that's kind of the more common thing but then if it's important enough we'll just come back to it in the next month mm. And if you're thinking that Ralph might be sounding a little bit nasally, that's because he is. Because he's got a stinking cold. So you're going to have to forgive um, him. Well, you say that, but I'm waiting for the uh, the four horsemen coaches to arrive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's hungover. <laughs> Pity me. Pity me. <laughs> no. Do your, do your hosting. Get on with it. Right, okay. Okay, so this month we've been treated to a bumper month of astronomy revelation thanks to the good people in our university's astrophysics department and while Beetlejuice still hasn't gone pop unless it has in the couple of days between recording and publishing Mark the Fridge there's still no shortage of excitement in this exploding supernova of news Jen, what have you got for us? Well, I'm going to be a little bit different and I'm going to bring you some of the brilliant research from the various astrophysics departments that Ralph has mentioned uh, that seems to have kind of slipped under the radar a little bit recently. Hmm. And all the papers I'm going to talk about are available on the archive, that wonderful melting pot of knowledge. Uh, so if anyone who's listening does want to kind of get the full picture, you can look them up on there afterwards. Um, or at the very least, they've got some pretty pictures. So go and have a look at them. So, first up, we've got a study from Dartmouth College in Hanover, and it's all about Cassiopeia A, which is one of the best studied supernova remnants in our galaxy. So, Cass A was a Type 2b supernova explosion, which means that it was caused by the gravitational collapse of a giant star, and the light of the explosion is believed to have reached us about 300 years ago, uh, well, you know, long before the advent of modern astronomy, right? That means, because it was so long ago, we don't really know much about the progenitor star, um, how the star lost its mass before it exploded, and, well, to be honest, anything about the star before it went kaboom. However, in this new study, Catherine Whale and her team studied the material around Cassie, and they have found clumpy and filamentary material that is distinctly different to the other diffuse material in the region. Now, fast-moving knots from the supernova remnant have been interacting with this material, and that indicates that this different material is at the same distance as the remnant. And as mm -hmm. such, they believe that this different material is actually what remains of the progenitor star's red supergiant wind, which sort Ooh. of accumulated Ooh. against a big cloud of ionised hydrogen near to the remnant. Um, and I think that that is actually super exciting. Mm, it um, is. Like, just because the fact that this material exists, let alone, you know, sort of studying what it's made of, its composition, it's going to help us unravel what happened before the star exploded, like before we, we even really had proper telescopes to sort of mm. really talk about, right? It's amazing. Um, yeah, it's kind of like clues to the puzzle, isn't it? Mm. Oh, it is. It is true galactic archaeology, right? It's amazing. Yeah. Um, but this, I feel like this information is quite pertinent at the minute, you know, because um, of the possible, but honestly not probable, impending violent death of a certain nearby red giant star. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I thought that was a really cool study. And the name of the paper, yeah. for anyone who's interested, is Detection of the Red Supergiant Wind from the Progenitor of Cassiopeia A. So... Next story, I'm going to take a deep tour from Exploding Stars and I'm going to talk about exoplanets. Bit of a passion of mine. Good. Yeah. And we might have an explanation for how some of the weirdest exoplanet systems out there come into existence. So, when we started discovering exoplanets in large numbers in the previous decade, the, the huge variety of systems that we found really astonished us, um, particularly because... So if even today, we haven't found a extrasolar system that's like our solar system. One of the most difficult types of systems to explain are systems where there's a giant planet orbiting a really like low mass star, like an M dwarf star. Because um, to be honest, 
those systems are not really supposed to exist according to our theories of planet formation. But we know that they do exist because we found them. So how? Um, there's been a new study by um, Yihan Wan of Stony Brook University in New York, and they may have found the answer. So they've used something called N-body simulations, and they found that these systems where you've got this giant planet and the small star, they can be created during stellar interactions. So what they think happens is that the giant planet is actually formed around a larger kind of solar type star and then gravitational disturbances caused by a stellar flyby between the solar type star and the smaller dwarf star cause the giant planet to be essentially stolen by the smaller star. Ooh. Ooh. Mm. So then this sort of interaction could be pretty common actually for stars that are in open clusters. And a nice bit of evidence, which gives a bit of credit to this theory, is that the simulations show that these planet systems, where you've got the giant planet around the M dwarf star, um, they should have highly eccentric orbits. So that means instead of orbiting in a perfect circle, they're kind of their orbits are more kind of like an oval. And we do actually see this in giant planet low stellar mass systems like GJ three five one two B which is an M dwarf with a planet about half the mass of Jupiter, and that's got an orbital eccentricity of about 0.4. So I thought mm. that was pretty cool as well. That is a cool story. I like that. Mm. I'm glad that there's the simulation in there as well that uh, get, that takes it away from being just a kind of hypothesis. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think it's, it's a lovely bit of work. Um, but it really does go to show that planets are weird and we really do have no idea what's going on with them. Um, but if you'd like to know more, the paper is called Giant Planet Swaps During Close Stellar Encounters. Ooh. Yeah. So, what's your last news story, My Jen? last news story. I'm sticking with planets, but this time, much closer to home, Mercury. Mercury, named after the messenger of the gods because of its proximity to the sun. Mercury is a tricky little sod. Um, it is. It is, not just because it's really hard to see, um, but because it's kind of left planet formation theorists scratching their heads for some time. So Mercury is, is a weird planet because it's got a very, very large iron core, unusually large for its size. Um, and people don't really know why. So over the years, there's been lots of ideas. Um, the most popular theory has been that Mercury was once much larger than its current size and early in its history, much like what happened to Earth um, in its early history, it kind of underwent some massive collision or impact that knocked away much of the outer, lighter, silicate mantle. But the problem's always been that in the past, all the models have shown that all that knocked off material should have been just like re-accreted back onto Mercury. And so the planet should have basically retained the size that it had and shouldn't have this, you know, abnormally large core because it should just be a bigger planet anyway. So there's been a new study by Christopher Spaulding and Fred Adams of Yale University and the University of Michigan. And they've shown that actually the primordial solar wind would have provided enough drag on the expelled material to remove a lot of it from Mercury's orbit, either by decelerating it so it spirals in towards the sun or throwing it outwards by the radiation pressure from the solar wind. And that means that that material wouldn't have been able to be re-accreted and all of this sort of disturbance of this material would have happened on time scales that were shorter than the time scale for the reaccretion. Um, and this works because the solar wind from the very young sun was a lot stronger than it is today. Um, and this model might actually help explain any other kind of unusually small and dense exoplanets that we might find around other stars. Mm -hmm. So again... A nice, nice little bit of modelling has uh, revealed some interesting answers. And yeah. if anyone wants to read the paper, it's called The Solar Wind Prevents Reaccretion of Debris After Mercury's Giant Impact. It must cool. be done. So, cool. I like so that Paul one. So, beat uh, astronomy uh, archaeology. That, that's a difficult one, isn't it? Mm. 
Well, first up for me, it's uh, a galaxy that has stopped producing stars. Mm. Now, overall, we would expect star formation in galaxies to fall off with time. Clearly, as material is absorbed into stars, there's less material to form new stars. And, of course, throwing good old entropy and over time, the rate of star formation should decline. Well, we see that in the Milky Way, where the current rate of star formation is thought to be about 0.68 to 1.45 solar masses of new star a year. Yeah. Which is bugger all, really. Mm. But there is still some formation going on. So... Remember, that's, that's across a galaxy that's a couple of hundred billion stars. So, mm. you know, no wonder older astronomers assumed the, the constancy to the sky, that it was unchanging. Well, of course, here's, here's a galaxy that would really fit their, their kind of ideas yeah. how the universe used to work, because this is galaxy XMM2599. Catchy name. Um, and it appears to be a monster galaxy. It's huge. Um, that behaved like that person you always have in a team. You, you know the one, full of enthusiasm for the you know the start of the project, really go for the idea, work really hard for a couple of days, and then utterly lose interest and sit there not being very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> well, a team led by Ben Forrest at the University of California have looked at this huge galaxy, which was an oddity anyway because of its early size and over 300 billion stars in less than 2 billion years after the Big Whoa. Bang. Whoa. I know, huge. Um, and discovered that not only is it an early forming massive galaxy, but that it stopped star formation after that initial two billion years. Uh. Well, so they detected like no stopped. It just stopped. So they detected no UV or ionized oxygen in spectral analysis, which indicates star formation. Um, and to give you an idea, so so this what they said the spectral analysis of, of the stars and the things it suggests that the galaxy stopped forming stars eleven billion years ago. To give so you an idea weird. of how amazing this object is. The work the team did suggests that XM2599, sorry, XMM2599, produced 1,000 solar masses of star every year for 500 million years. Can you just... If you had that sort of star formation rate, you'd be you'd literally see a new star in the sky cropping up every, I don't know, few weeks or something, because, you know, obviously we yeah, can't exactly. see, it. We can't I mean. see all parts of the galaxy, but... Every few but, weeks, you'd be like, "Oh, no, no, that's a new star. Oh, there's another one. New exactly. one. Exactly. Oh, Imagine if, if, yeah, if you could exist in on a planet in the middle of that galaxy, kind of, you you would start saying, the, the, yeah, exactly. You you would just see these things winking on almost incredibly. Oh well, these the sort of nebulas suddenly lighting up. And yeah, it would just be incredible. Um, and then it, after this sort of incredible starburst activity, it just stops. So the, the sort of analysis at the moment suggests. And this has thrown a bit of a spanner in the old model and simulation world of cosmology and galaxies because no current model or simulation can produce this result. Yeah. I, 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 this, as you've been going through this story, I'm like, no. But that doesn't yeah. make sense. No. Exactly. So as, ev- as ever, more work to be done. And the team uh, they've used the Keck and Mosfire data so far uh, are looking to turn Hubble... Um, and Alma onto this beastie and get better visuals and to have a look at, you'll be glad to know, Jenny, um, th- at and through the dust. Uh, um, of course, yeah, because if it's got this huge pro- prolific star formation rate, then it's going to be producing yeah. a hell of a lot of dust, right? Exactly. And also there's 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 still the sneaking suspicion that maybe there is star formation going on, but it's just hidden. Mm. So, you know, maybe we need a little peer through the dust and have a look. But... Um, if you wanted to read more of this, it's in the uh, IOP, the Institute of Physics Astrophysical Journal Letters, um, and it's called An Extremely Massive Quiescent Galaxy at Z Equals 3.493, Evidence of Insufficiently Rapid Quenching Mechanisms in Theoretical Models. <laughs> that title makes you want to rush out and read it, doesn't it? It does, <laughs> it does, completely. But it was about something really quite fascinating. It is very cool. Uh, next up... Um, is Mars and it would appear that Mars might not be the entirely dead world we've thought it to be mm. clearly we're here but you huh. know we're talking geologically and yeah. meteorologically and everything um, Insight has provided some new data on the internals of Mars and served up a nice mystery in meteorology um, it looks like there are regular and persistent Mars quakes and that there may be magma below the surface are you sure it's not magma. you too? Uh, well, magma Magma, flow into the magma. Uh, now, Insight has been having difficulty with its drill. You've probably heard on off. We've talked about it the, 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 over the last few months. Uh, leading speculation that the surface may not provide enough friction for drilling. 
interesting enough. Um, so an observation that, of course, is going to be relevant to the Rosalind Franklin rover, yeah. which is taking a soccer great drill with it. Um, it's all right, although it will get through the surface, the Rosalind Franklin, just not in the way they're intending. Um, but its seismometer on the InSight has been providing good data, and it appears that Mars is more active and perhaps a little less geologically dead than was thought. Um, in terms of meteorology, there is something perhaps even more interesting, and there's observations that indicate the presence of gravity waves, which are called, these are parcels of air that oscillate on Earth. Uh, they can create those lines of cloud you see in the sky, particularly in the morning, you know, those kind of ripple clouds you mm. get. Mm. Um, and they've been recorded on Mars. Oh, wow. uh, not the clouds, but the the sort of pressure differences and the, these these what they call gravity waves mm. in the in the, uh, the air that cause them. Um, and combined with this, they've recorded infrasound, and that's sound that's below ten hertz. No, no one's sure what the source is. It's you two. Something. To, it's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if it's um, low frequency, it'll be us. <laughs> it's very low frequency. Um, it it's. Clearly something to do with the meteorology, but they've recorded this this sort of odd infrasound, um, and there's, it's a nice little set up a nice little mystery. What is causing the infrasound yeah. on Mars? Um, this is, of course, the second mysterious finding from Insight that includes the weird magnetic pulses um, that were observed back in September. Yeah, that's definitely um, U two powering up the rays. That was absolutely. Not a mystery. Um, so fascinating series of findings from a craft that's been in the shadow of the more glamorous rovers. But yeah is actually probably at the moment providing the, the kind of key science on Mars or certainly the key observations. Yeah, it's the Gaia of Mars. It's a spacecraft that's getting no glory, but it's mm. going to be providing such rich science and, and insights. Oh, it's called Insight. Ah. Hey! hey. It's, almost so. like, it's almost like they thought about the name! Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, and sticking with Mars, my last one, um, there's some new debate over its formation history. Um, a team from the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio has demonstrated that early Mars was continually struck by planetesimals. Oh. Yeah. They Ooh. looked at Martian meteorites to understand the composition of Mars's mantle and looked for elements that attracted to iron. So um, the, n the nature of these elements and their ratios have, have showed the mantle that is probably more like a marble cake. So normally these elements would be in the core, so they'd be draw, sort of drawn to the iron core. So imagine on Earth most of our sort of things like gold and tungsten and things like that have all been sort of drawn into gold. the into the core. So actually Earth's, mainly Earth's kind of heavy metals essentially are, are all locked up in the core. And the stuff we use on the surface that's in the crust has just come from asteroid and meteorite impacts. Well... They were looking at the mantle here, and what they found is actually Mars's mantle is, is like a, a sort of marble cake effect in that it's actually it's full of all this sort of heavy stuff. Um, and oh, don't tell the billionaires that. Oh, don't tell them that. They're going to just go drilling everywhere. I know, they will, won't they? Um, they were looking at tungsten isotopes, um, so you can see sort of you know, how long this stuff's been there and things like that. And the they think that Mars may have taken 20 million years to form as the planet we see today. Yeah. Which is actually a very long process. Yeah. We think that, you know, the Earth, for instance, is, is much, much shorter than that. We're talking, you know, probably hundreds of thousands of years to form the Earth. Maybe a couple of million years at most, but not 20 million years. Wow. Um, so we're looking at... Uh, a planet that took a long time to form. So the core was already formed and then this stuff accreted around it um, yeah. and it, it took a while to build up. Um, partly might explain why Mars is quite small as well, with all these impacts and the fact that the core, it's not, you know, I often thought the Mars' core may have formed and then the stuff kind of drew around it. Yeah, right. If you want to look at more of that, that's in the Journal of Science Advances from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, and it's called A Compositionally Heterogeneous Martian Mantle Due to Late Accretion. Another, Ooh, another snappy, snappy title. Snappy title. Ah, huh, jinx. Oh. <laughs> oh. And that's me done. Okay, so for the discussion news story this month, we're going to start with an incredible image. Uh, mm. Using the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope, astronomers have actually captured the dimming of Betelgeuse in detail. And these images of the star surface show that not only um, is the red supergiant fading, as we all know, but bizarrely also how its apparent shape is changing. 
So, mm. given that we uh, we now have a new hypothesis that's been widely touted by Jen, do you want to take this one away, Jen? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear you can hear a chomping, chomping oh, at the gods, bit. Oh my gods! Yeah. I mean, okay. we should probably take that off of her, but I mean, <laughs> bridles and saddles and things. But we don't do that anymore these days, no, do we? No, no. They do in Wales. It's very Victorian <laughs> yeah. to bridle your women folk. <laughs> I just and have no hence, reply to that. I just genuinely don't know what to say to hence it. Hence the name, The Bride. But there we go. <laughs> Is that actually true? Yes. Is that where, where like, the bride comes from? Yes. <gasps> and the groom, because the groom looks after horses. Yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> shut up, no. It's not just astronomy on this show. <laughs> yeah, you were, you were traded like a f***ing horse by your dad. <gasps> oh my god is that where the words come from who led you down the aisle and then gave you to a new groom oh my god that's horrendous mm-hmm. wow yeah yeah well let's 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 go back to the shocking astronomy instead of the shocking culture shall we <laughs> move away from that yeah, so the um, the whole debate about like, ooh, Beetlejuice is changing shape, that's so weird. Um, I don't think it is actually that weird. Um, I'm going to be a little bit controversial here and say that. I think the shape change is kind of exaggerated by the fact that we've got these bright spots and these dim spots. Because, like... You, you can if you look at the images you you can clearly see that there's been a shape change right you you can't deny it but i think that it's also exaggerated by the the brightness differences that we have um someone on twitter uh what oh, i've got his name written down here there is uh brendan drackler now he has for some reason i would have assumed that this would have gone viral but he hasn't had that many likes and stuff on it but Go on to his Twitter so it's um drackler is uh, d r a c h l e r and um, he took a simulation that someone did of a red supergiant star like Betelgeuse. And these stars on their surface, they have these huge convective cells um, where material is being churned up from deep within the star and brought up to the surface. And these cells are so big that sort of one of them can cover 5% of the surface of these star, right? So they're absolutely enormous. And these huge convective cells, as they're broiling away they can physically change the shape of the star so it's not perfectly round there might be a bit that sticks out or a bit that's like a little bit closer or or whatever um what he did is he took this high resolution simulation and he downgraded the resolution so that you can see the simulation as we would see it if we look at this star with a telescope like you know the most powerful telescope that we have and it's amazing how as these cells are broiling and changing the star looks like it's changing shape Mm. much like we see it it's uncannily similar to the way that we see it in these ESO images and so although I think everyone's kind of losing their mind that oh my god this star isn't round I think if you delve into the science actually that's to be expected because of these massive convective cells these that are broiling and, and they are physically changing the shape of the star so I don't think the shape of the star is is too much to be worried about um but what I think the best bit about these images is that there's this big dark patch, which to me looks like a cloud of dust. Now, <laughs> I'm not saying that I said it was dust, but I think it's dust. Um, especially like if you compare these two images that were taken by the VLT from January of last year and December of last year, uh, to me, it really does look like a great big cloud of dust that's kind of obscuring the southern hemisphere of Beetle Beetlejuice. Um, so, in terms of like, do we have any proof as to like, is Beetlejuice kind of going to keep dimming? Is it about to explode or anything? Um, so, there was actually a paper released a couple of days on Archive um, where someone has taken some spectra of Beetlejuice and you know confirming that you know yes yes it's dimmer blah 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 um but there's nothing to suggest that any of the spectral features have changed at all they're all the same they're just not as bright as they were and so 
as far as this research is concerned, uh, the dimming of Beetlejuice is not because it's about to go boom. It's because of something to do with these convective, convective cells or it's because there's a great big cloud of dust in the way. And that's not just some crazy Welsh girl shouting the word dust into the void. That's proper science. Um, and also Beetlejuice um, does have these these two cycles over which it dims there's a 425 day cycle and a 5.9 year cycle and uh months and months ago uh astronomers thought that this dimming phase might just be um coincidental minima between these two different cycles and they predicted that if that was the case then it would um start to brighten again around the end of january and if you look at uh Beetlebot, which is at Beetlebot on Twitter, which I'm going to do right now just to see what the latest thing is. At Beetlebot is great. It gives you a daily update on the brightness of Beetlejuice based on um, V-band measurements, I think. And um, according to Beetlebot, Beetlejuice is starting to brighten again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Beetlejuice got down to about... um, I think it got down to about 39%. I think it was 37. It got down to about 37% yes. of its brightness. Yes, it did. It got down to 37% it kind of, percent of its typical brightness. Mm. And as of today, as we're recording, it's now up to 43% of its typical brightness. So that's a 6% yeah. increase. And so I think maybe it was just the coincidentally these two cycles. It's mm-hmm. almost like I had that as a news story when it first started and you were so obsessed with it being dust, you, you decided to go with that. But it's, it's just because I was right, Ralph. It's almost but, like I've studied dust for like six years. It's a coincidental minima <laughs> of the cycles. Yeah, no, it probably co- is. It is, in all seriousness, it is probably just those two cycles coincided. And that's why we've we've had this this dimming, and you know, the predictions were the end of January. It started to brighten sort of three weeks into February. I think as as unpredictable as Beetlejuice is, I feel like we can forgive them for being three weeks out. Um, the pictures to me seem to indicate that there's probably some dust involved as well. Uh, so I am going to cling on to. The, the <laughs> edge of dust. Like I will cling on to it forever. But um, yeah. And and either way, the fact that it has dimmed so much, uh, making quite a spectacle in the sky for um, for Orion viewers, it's it's just been really interesting and really exciting in its own right. Mm. It's really made people look at the night sky. Hmm. Because I feel like everyone's been talking about it. People really have been like, oh, have you, have you seen Beetlejuice? Like, people have been saying it's really dim. Is it? Like, yeah. But it's just, I feel like you just sometimes need something that's a little bit sort of intriguing and exciting. Like, oh, we don't really know what's mm. going on. Just yeah. to kind of pique people's interest, particularly people who are not usually interested in astronomy. If everyone's yeah. talking about it, then, you know, humans are sheep, right? Yeah, follow the crowds, and, and of course, it's really, it's really good that it was Beetlejuice that was doing it as well. One that we are expecting to go pop in the near term. Yeah, yeah, everyone, everyone's still excited about that. Everyone's yeah. still waiting for that to happen. But I don't think it's going to go pop. No. Soz guys. No. Nah. Yeah. It was always the um, the more exciting but less likely. Yeah. No, we'll we'll all be dead. We'll all be dead. Now, yeah, if it's going to go, it'll go when the sun is sitting in Orion and no one can see it it'll it'll go in August (laughs) yeah and then no one can see it anyway (laughs) and then it'll come come to the autumn and everyone go where the is that gone (laughs) (laughs) and they're going to be like oh guys guys Orion looks weird yeah (laughs) oh man that's alright then Elon Musk can just get one of his Starlink satellites to just sort of stay there yeah. <laughs> hey, guys, guys, bride update. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. See, because because I I live in a house with someone who's into etymology. Fact checking. Yeah. Fact checking. Why you were chatting? It actually comes from the word that means daughter-in-law. 
Oh, so and, it's not as sexist as we thought then. Well, no, because it, it comes from a, a really old word called brewer, which, um, of course, you might pick up something. It's someone who makes food and the beer does the brewing. And, of course, you were married into a family. You were basically given to a family. And you were the one that did the cooking for the whole family. So it is just as sexist. Oh, so it is as bad as we thought then. Yeah, and in fact, just it's related to bad. A, it's related to an old Frisian word, apparently, that means um, house gift. Oh, ah. lovely. Whereas I'll bridal... I'll just stick a bow on my forehead, shall I? Exactly. Whereas bridal, <laughs> as in the horse thing, um, actually means to move quickly. There you go. Hey, I tell you what, no one's moving quickly in a wedding dress. I'll tell you that for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you, as, we're, as we're about to go into the Sky Guide, just pop the tea on, would you, love? Yeah. Two sugars, is it? No, sweet enough Turkish. <laughs> And so with just a handful of weeks left before we turn our night sky enjoyment over to the farmers and let them dick around with the clocks, we're going to power on into the hardcore astronomy part of the show with a look around the great spring constellation, Cancer. Ah, Cancer. The crab. One of the zodiac constellations. You know, the ones where if Mercury is in Gatorade, then a pigeon's going to poop fire on your dog or something. I don't know. <laughs> Now, Zodiac Constellations. <laughs> oh, I tried to keep a straight face after that. And all I can hear is I, I could get laughing. behind astrology like that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Zodiac Constellations, uh, they do have astrophysical meaning. They are the constellations through which the sun and the planets appear to pass through over the course of a year. Uh, of course, the sun's not really moving through these constellations. It's just how we perceive the Earth's motion around the sun. So, if that doesn't rile up your local astrologer, why not tell them that their astrological signs don't even line up with the constellations anymore anyway because of the precession of the Earth's axis? And there are actually 13 constellations along the zodiac and the missing one, if you're wondering, is Ophiuchus. Uh, pretty sure by that point they'll be gone realigning their chakras or something. <laughs> now, back into astronomy, um, we're going to take a quick look at the mythology behind the constellation of Cancer. Um, so, it's a crab, and this crab was sent by Hera to destroy Hercules. Why, you ask? Why did she want to destroy the hero that is Hercules? Well, it's because he was born of an affair by Zeus with a human woman, and Hera, quite frankly, hated the poor kid because of it. Poor Hercules, not his fault. Now, it's said that the giant crab hmm. attached itself to Hercules as he was battling the Hydra, uh, but Hercules, being Hercules, just kind of crushed it. However, because Cancer was so obedient and sacrificed himself in the name of doing Hera's bidding, she placed its image in the heavens, and that's where the constellation came from. Um, Yeah, it sounds sweet, but to be honest, I don't think Hera was wearing her glasses when she did it, um, because the constellation really does not look like a crab um, (laughs) at all. So Cancer is, again, another constellation of dim stars and only two of them are brighter than fourth magnitude. It lies between Leo the Lion and Gemini the Twins and a line drawn between Regulus in Leo and Pollux in Gemini will be bisected by this constellation, which sort of looks like an upside-down Y shape with the vertex of the Y marked by the fourth magnitude red giant star Acellus Australis close to the Beehive Cluster. It's... A middling sized constellation, I'd say. Um, It kind of spans a distance, a little more of that between Regulus and the star at the tip of the lion's head in Leo. And I'm going to suggest a couple of deep sky treats to observe or image in the constellation of Cancer this month. And we can't start any suggestions without immediately going to Messier 44, the beehive cluster Precipi, one of the finest open clusters in the entire night sky. Oh, yeah. Although first telescopically observed by Galileo in 1609, the Beehive Cluster had been observed for millennia as it's one of the few naked eye visible clusters. In fact, it's sometimes easier to pick out as a smudge halfway between Leo and Gemini 
than the stars make in the constellation of Cancer itself. But if you do need some easy guidance, take a look halfway between Al Jabba, the magnitude 3.4 blue white supergiant denoting the chest of Leo the Lion, and was at the magnitude 3.5 yellowy white star in the groin of Pollux, the closer of the two Gemini twins. Messier 44 covers a whopping degree and a half in the sky in the centre of Cancer. That's three full moon widths and is a loose collection of more than 1,000 stars around 600 million years old, some 600 light years away. And we know there are at least three hot Jupiter exoplanets around sun-like stars in this cluster. Ooh, I like that. Mm, nice little fact, isn't it? Next up is the more overlooked Messier 67. At around 4 billion years old, this open cluster makes the beehive look like an infant and is particularly intriguing to professional astronomers because there is very little dust in the way to obscure our view and it contains those bizarre blue straggler stars that are larger, bluer and more luminous than all the other stars in the cluster. To take a look at the half a degree across magnitude 6.1 cluster, stay with Al Jabba in the chest of Leo and look halfway along a line between that and bright Procyon in the constellation Canis Major. You should be right on top of it with your finder scope. Both clusters look great in small scopes and make very impressive images with the shortest of exposures, which means a zoom lens on a DSLR steadied with a tripod will almost certainly reveal them well, but binoculars are probably the best way to observe them. As always, with deep sky objects, aim for nights when the moon is out of the way for the best views, so this month we'll be hoping for clear nights in the fourth week of March between the 22nd and the 28th, when the moon is new and the skies are dark. So Paul, what do we look at this month in the solar system? Venus, go outside, look west in the evening, the end. <laughs> yes. That's it. That's all I'm saying. That's it. Yeah, no. you, can't, you can't miss it. In fact, as I was yeah. walking over to the studio today, I could yep. see the... Th- thinnest slenderest moon hanging just below venus it was yeah. glorious it's beautiful it was beautiful out there yeah I, seriously um for the evening astronomer and frankly that's most of us who have a job um <laughs> then venus is where it's all at at the moment with planets um and it's looking glorious oh yeah uh, mid-month sitting between aries and cetus a dazzling minus 3.92 Ooh. i know uh be a 56 percent illuminated if you take a closer look, uh, by month's end, it's climbed into Taurus, for now, um, mm. and will have reached minus 4.05. Oh, that's brighter than I thought it ever got. I thought it yeah. only got up to four. And while less illuminated, with its phase being below 50% by that point, it will be close to Earth, so it's going to yeah. be a lot brighter. Yeah. Um, for those of you who get up early or don't need to be in the office, there is a spectacular view building just before sunrise. Mars, Jupiter and Saturn will be having a little merry conjunction dance in the east just above the eastern horizon. Mm. So at the start of the month, if you look east after 4am, you will see a nice close procession of Mars, Jupiter and Saturn rising. As we progress through the month, this will change with Mars sliding past Jupiter, appearing pretty close from the 14th and being closest uh, 19th to 21st, appearing in the same eyepiece in fact. The 18th will see the crescent moon parked right next to them as well, just to ramp up the beauty factor to 11. Mm. Uh, So then Mars continues its slide and ends the month parked next to Saturn, being closest from the 30th to the 2nd of April. The 26th is perhaps the main day you want to have a look if you've only got sort of limited early morning time. You only want one morning to get up and have a look. Um, And that will be Mars will be right in the centre of the two giants, forming a nice triple conjunction. Oh, I like that. So well worth a, a good look. Yeah, it'll be really beautiful. Um, and that's that's that. So I've just got a couple of little tidbits to add. Um, if you're still not sure how to find the constellation of Cancer, there's actually a close approach of the moon with M44, which is what Ralph talked about, um, on the 6th of the month. So they're going to be separated by about one and a half degrees on the sky. Um probably too wide for most telescopes even small telescopes but you'll be able to see both of them in a pair of binoculars at the same time so Mm. nice little way to find cancer Mm. and of course the 20th is the spring equinox so basically astronomy's done with in the northern hemisphere because the nights are only going to get shorter and shorter Mm. bad news Mm. Um, just one meteor shower to tell you about this month and we return to the southern hemisphere oh get your wobble boards out 
<laughs> so this is for the benefit of the seven people and the 12 million penguins who live there. From the 7th <laughs> to the 23rd of March is the Gamma Normids meteor shower, originating in the small faint constellation of Norma, halfway between the popular magnitude 1.8 double star Sargus in Scorpius and the super bright Rigel Centaurus in Centaurus. The Gamma Normids were only first observed in 1929 in Auckland, New Zealand, and it's still unclear which comet's remnants are burning up in our atmosphere to produce this shower. So take your pick. It's either C1864 R1 Donati or C1893 U1 Brooks. Ah. The peak of the shower occurs on the 15th. The peak of the shower occurs on the 15th, quite literally the Ides of March, with a dismal hourly rate of between 6 and 10, but they are generally rather bright, and a string of studies in the 1980s showed that between 9 and 20% of them leave nice smoke trails in their wake. But get comfortable and face south around the 15th, and you should be rewarded with some nice meteors and smoke trails before the moon rises around 11pm for our Antipodean listeners. I think we should do something for them every month now. You think so? I feel I feel like we should. We should like sort of the the colonial masters that we really want to be. Oh, I like the sound of that, Paul. Yeah, we should just <laughs> like, you know, brush something off the table for them. Oh yeah, I like that. Feed them some scraps. Yeah. Um, all we have left for you is the moon, which this month is first quarter on the second, full on the ninth, last quarter on the sixteenth, and new on the twenty fourth. The full moon is a super moon. Way not that important, but the millennials love that. Sh- so I thought I'd mention it. Um, I wish you clear skies and happy hunting. So I hope you enjoyed our introduction to the electromagnetic spectrum last month. From your emails and tweets, it looks like you did, but perhaps mm. you're just being diplomatic little devils and don't want to offend us by saying you don't like this segment. Well, tough. If you say now, you get now. So we're pressing ahead, and this month we're going to take a look at the radio end of the electromagnetic spectrum. Jen. Radio waves. Yeah. The longest wavelengths of any light in the electromagnetic spectrum, which means these waves correspond to the light that has the lowest amount of energy. And as to what the wavelength range of radio waves is, that is harder to say than it sounds. It kind of depends who you ask, um, but for our purposes, from an astronomical point of view, we're looking at wavelengths from a couple of millimetres up to tens of metres. So in this show, we're not going to discuss the history and the pioneers of this amazing field. Uh, that's for part two. In this show, we're going to discuss what we can learn by studying the sky at radio wavelengths. So start off we're going to talk about why radio telescopes are so damn big perfect example for our uk listeners is the 76 meter level telescope at georgia bank and our american friends will be familiar with the 100 meter green bank telescope in west virginia so as big as bob the dob is radio telescopes truly shit on every other telescope when it comes to size but why simply it's because the wavelengths of light are so large. The resolution of your image, so the size of the smallest detail that you can clearly see of an object, is directly proportional to the wavelength you're observing at and inversely proportional to the diameter of your telescope's collecting area. So let's pretend that you've got a two meter telescope that can observe at wavelengths of one millimeter and one meter. So when observing at the shorter wavelength you'll have a resolution a thousand times greater than when you observe at the longer wavelength. And this is why radio telescopes need to be so big. It's so that we can actually see anything at all. And as an interesting aside, the long wavelength observations are why radio telescopes are kind of left open to the elements. So when you make a telescope mirror, you care about flaws on the scale of the wavelength of light that you're observing at because these will affect your measurements. But because these radio waves are so long wavelength, a bit of bird poop doesn't matter. It's fine. So, single dish radio telescopes, although they're great, they can be built, we understand the technology very well, these telescopes are very slow. So the way you observe with them is you have to scan your object, um, literally up and down, up and down, back and forth, and that's how you build up a picture. Because if you're lucky, you've got a handful of pixels, sometimes you've only got one. So you have to kind of slowly build up an image of your object. 
And the best way to get really high resolution data with radio waves is how several radio dishes spread out over a large area. And this is called interferometry. Two separated dishes act like one giant radio dish where the size of the radio dish is essentially the separation between these two smaller dishes. And then you use multiple pairs of radio dishes with different spacing combined together to give you unrivaled resolution at radio wavelengths. Probably the most famous one of these is ALMA, that Atacama Large Millimeter Array. So, as to what you can observe with radio waves, well, I feel like the question should be what can't you observe with radio waves? So, studying the sun at radio wavelengths allows us to monitor for potentially dangerous coronal mass ejections. Mercury has been mapped using radio waves, which were fired at the planet, then reflected off it and then collected again here at the Earth, revealing the ice at the polar caps. Radio waves allowed us to peer beneath the clouds of Venus, reveal the hidden mountainous terrain. Radio astronomy helps us understand the intense radiation belts surrounding Jupiter, created by charged particles which are trapped in its strong magnetic field. And, as I'm sure you guys have done, or at least some of you have done, you know that you can track meteors with radio telescopes as they kind of whiz through the atmosphere. So, moving beyond our solar system, radio emission from atomic hydrogen gas was first used to map out the spiral arms of our own galaxy way back in, I think it was the 50s. And this emission is sometimes called the 21 centimeter line. So atomic hydrogen is the simplest atom you can get. You've got a proton in the middle and an electron orbiting that proton. And all particles, including protons and electrons, they have a property called spin. And particles are naturally lazy, and they always like to be in their lowest energy system possible. And this, for a hydrogen atom, is when the proton spin is one way, and then the electron spin is in the complete opposite direction. Now, however, if the atoms of hydrogen get excited and they absorb some energy, this can cause the spin of the electron to flip to be the same as the proton. And it doesn't like being in this state. It wants to go back to the nice, relaxed, lazy state that it was in before. So when it does this, when it relaxes back into its original state, it releases the energy that it previously absorbed and it releases it as a photon and it has a wavelength of 21 centimeters. This is where this 21 centimeter emission comes from. And this emission can sail unimpeded through the galaxy, allowing us to trace hydrogen gas clouds that might otherwise be hidden by dust. And not just in our galaxy, but we can use this to get really detailed images of the gas in other galaxies too. Now, beyond this, radio waves have been detected at the cores of many galaxies. So that includes our own galaxy. And the, this is where the radio emission has been emitted by free electrons spiraling around really strong magnetic field lines. They've also been found from powerful jets, which are emitted by the supermassive black holes at the centres of these galaxies. And it's actually this radio emission from these jets that helps us to detect the most distant galaxies in the universe by quasars, which is the very bright cause of these galaxies. And finally, we can't forget how radio waves were used to discover pulsars, but we're going to talk more about pulsars in part two of this month. So, in summary, Radio telescopes are huge to allow us to see fine details in this long wavelength radiation and radio waves allow us to study phenomena right across the universe that we wouldn't be able to see otherwise. And that's radio astronomy. Well, that's all we've got for you now. It's time for us to go back to plotting your destruction and you to go back to enacting your own destruction. Hell, why not? Peace isn't exactly your nature. Anyway, keep an eye on Beetlejuice, you never know, and enjoy Venus, particularly on the 28th when it'll be forming a triangle with the moon and the Pleiades. And it's almost time for Astro Camp, the friendliest star party around. So for three nights in April, so the 25th to the 28th, we're going to be taking over a campsite in the National Dark Sky area of the Brecon Beacons in Wales. So come and join us for a long weekend of stargazing, talks, workshops, and of course, a bevy or two. Um, I'm going to be there, massively jet lagged, back from <laughs> New York, but I'm hoping that means it'll make staying up all night a lot easier. That's my plan anyway. 
I just want to say I love you. All of you. Well, well, except you. No one loves you. Who could, frankly? Oh. So until our space exploration show on the Ides of March, that's the 15th for the ignoramuses out there, it's goodbye from Sidonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Sidonia Base, end of transmission.